From the economy to government and newsmakers to what's going on in your community, this is CW14 Focus with Robert Hornacek. Good morning and welcome to CW14 Focus. I'm your host, Robert Hornacek. Today we're focusing on a major industry that has helped shape our state's past, present, and our future. I'm talking about the logging and paper industries. I'm joined by Jeff Landon, the president of the Wisconsin Paper Council, and by Aaron Burmeister from Burmeister Logging. Aaron is also a member of the board of directors for the Great Lakes Timber Professionals Association, and you're a master logger? Certified master logger, yes. What does that mean exactly? What's a uh... Certified master logger, we're third party audited. They come in to make sure our business practices are in order. We follow all environmental laws. Uh, and, and, and environmental laws, government laws, mm -hmm. to make sure we are 100% compliance with everything we should be complying to. Okay. Um, thank you both for coming in. One thing we wanted to start off with was just how these, these industries, the paper industry, the logging industry, all the timber related industries are, are related and, and what's this, the state of those industries, if you will? And I guess I'll start with you, Jeff, on that. Kind of, how are we doing so far today as a state in these industries? We're doing relatively well. Uh, it's no secret that we've had a lot of challenges in the last few years with the paper industry. We've gone from being uh, an industry that employed about 52,000 people in the year 2000 to today about 31,000 people in the state of Wisconsin. So it's been a s significant decline. But the, the takeaway I always tell people is there are still 31,000 jobs in the pulp and paper industry in Wisconsin. Uh, and, but what is really important too uh, is the logging industry. I mean, we can only be as strong in the paper industry as we are with the logging industry because we need them to be vibrant and successful to provide the raw materials for the paper industry. So we, we are very intertwined, no doubt about it. A lot of the issues that impact the logging industry will impact the paper industry. Uh, we, we do see a lot of challenges ahead, uh, but I do think the paper industry in Wisconsin is well positioned to, to flourish in the future. Mm -hmm. Aaron, from, from, from your perspective, uh, the, the logging industry, how would you assess its its current uh, the, the current state of it. I think we're doing reasonably well with the, with the loss of quite a few of the mills we've lost. So with the with the Niagara Mill and the Kimberly Mill with uh, New Page, uh, the Brokaw Mill in Wausau, we've lost uh, quite a bit of our outlets. But we s many of the other mills have expanded and they need more raw materials. Uh, so I, I I think that part we're doing real well. Mm -hmm. uh, the resources there, uh, the forests right now are probably as healthy as they've ever been in the last 100 years or 100 plus years. We have bigger trees and more trees than we've had in the last 40 or 50 years. Really? So, yes, I mean, it's the forest dynamics are changing immensely right now. Yeah. If you had to, to, to put a kind of an, on a gauge or a scale of how important these industries are to Northeast Wisconsin specifically, um, maybe I'll start with you again, Jeff. What, how how important are these industries to our overall health of an, as an economy in this part of the state? Uh, granted, I'm biased, but I think the paper industry is probably the most important industry in northeast Wisconsin. The concentration of paper mills in, in the Fox River Valley from Appleton through Green Bay, it's the highest concentration in the world. Uh, in the, the world? In the world. And if you talk about the logging industry to the converters to the printing industry, which we have robust clusters in the northeast Wisconsin part of the state, uh, the paper industry and its, its importance and it, the need for it to succeed, I think, is uh, it's very important. And I think it's the, the, the preeminent industry in northeast Wisconsin. Are we still the number one, are we the number one state in the nation? Yes. In paper making? We have been over 50 years and I can't see that changing in the yeah. near future. Okay. Um, and we talked about, about the jobs and one thing I've always heard, I've never worked in the field, but one thing I've always heard is the logging, the paper industries, that these aren't just jobs. These are very, very good jobs. I mean, your company, I don't know how many em employees you have. I mean, what's the... We, we have three employees, including myself. Um, they get paid reasonably well, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but my employees, they enjoy working outdoors. You know, they, they get to see some of the fun things that a lot of these hikers and stuff try to go see. <laughs> you know, we can, we can see an otter or a fisher, no. you know. and. Some people love to be able to see that. Yeah. We, we'll get to see this, you know, monthly or something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How did this area become so concentrated? I mean, kind of walk us through a little bit, and both of you can kind of chime in on this of, of of the history of how this, how Northeast Wisconsin really became to be a world leader in this in this industry. 
Well, the paper industry in Wisconsin started in 1848, the year we became a state, started in Milwaukee to make uh, news rags at that time for the precursor to the journal Sentinel, uh, and it migrated north. Uh, two things you need for paper are water and wood, and obviously we have a tremendous amount of water and wood in this part of the, the state. And the Fox, the Fox River is just perfectly made with the, the way that the river flows and the, the ebbs and flows that it has, the, 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 uh, the, the falls that it has to make it a, a great, great source for making paper. So it just naturally came to this, this neck of the woods. And then the logging industry was, was already kind of taking hold, and mm -hmm. they just found a way to, to take their products for other things that they were making wood for, and they just put into the paper industry. And we just kept growing and growing and growing. Yeah. How has the logging industry changed? Uh I certainly don't need you to go back 150 years, but however long you've been doing it, I mean, what, what, what have you seen in the way uh, the industry has, has developed and changed in the last couple well, decades? When I started logging, and we, I made firewood for my high school teachers in 1976 with a log chain and a 77 Oliver with my dad and some of my brothers. And currently, right now, I run two crews with my son, Ben, and myself running the harvesters. These harvesters run about five hundred and fifty thousand dollars you know and they're capable of cutting eight ten twelve cords an hour wow. everything is ergonomically correct all you do is you sit there and push buttons it's where it's going to go in ten years i i don't know <laughs> but i can't see it making many more big jumps <laughs> so but it, it's it's great uh, what what would you say from the, the logging side of things is, a, is the biggest challenge your side of the industry faces? The biggest challenge, you deal with a lot of people that really don't understand logging. And they don't understand civil culture practices of, or, or managing trees. They just figure trees are going to grow forever. And the same thing that's here now is going to be a year, 100 years from now. But science shows if you want to keep this forest the same as it is now, you need to log. Because we can start tweaking this forest for endangered species and different species of trees. Um, so our biggest danger right now is really we're not logging enough. We're losing our early session type species, our birch, our poplar, our oaks. And these are all the best species to feed both game animals and birds and endangered species. When you say losing them, how do you mean? What do you early, mean? early concession means that if you take a farm field and you don't do nothing with it, the first species that come in are really uh, secession species. Okay. So you take like aspen. Aspen has 22, 24 percent protein in these buds. Pretty much a lot of birds, the grouse, turkeys and stuff, they'll feed on this all winter. The snow can be six feet deep, but if that bird can get in that tree, they can live. Yeah. If the, in, in the case of logging and deer and stuff that are, you know, the ground dwelling type animals, if they can, we can log and they can get to these buds, they can survive. Yeah. So. Jeff, do you think there are, Aaron spoke a little bit about kind of the people don't know enough about particular industries. Do you think there are misconceptions or things people just don't understand about the paper industry? I mean, we sit here and we take it for granted that we've got it all printed out and we've got our cardboard boxes and we've got our packaging, and but maybe we don't spend the time to think of what went into that? There's a lot of misconceptions about the industry, I believe. Uh, one of the biggest fears and one of the dangers we have is uh, over-regulation of the industry. Uh, there, there's the t you know, a lot of environmental rules that get proposed that uh, come down in the paper industry, but what people don't realize is that there's been a lot of changes in the industry to make ourselves more environmentally friendly on our own. Uh, market forces have dictated it. Uh, Aaron talked about certification. There's not a supplier or really an end user that does not want a, a product that is environmentally compliant. So we, paper mills over the, over the years have gotten a lot more friendly in their environmental practices. They're using less energy, which has fewer carbon emissions. That makes uh, you know everybody talks about CO2 and global warming. The, the paper industry on its own has done a lot to to bring bring down their CO2 emissions. So to make sure that they can uh, one they do save money, but two they're they're better for the environment. So one of our biggest one of the biggest misconceptions out there is the industry is dirty. It's it's not a dirty industry. It's it's a it's an incredibly clean industry. And the other misconception is it's a very it's a very uh, 
low tech. You know, people think it's a dirty, dingy mill. If you walked into a paper mill today, I think people would be surprised at how clean, how bright, and how technologically advanced they are. Aaron mm -hmm. talked about the, the way that he changed the uh, way you're logging in the woods. There, there are so many computers right now and technology in paper, paper mills now, I think people would be surprised and quite frankly stunned at the automation that goes into making the product. Yeah. And if people would understand that it's environmentally, it's a, it's a strong environmental record in the paper industry and it's a very technologically savvy industry, I think people would be, uh, people don't, don't think of those two things with, with paper. Yeah, um, and Aaron, going back to, to the logging industry and explaining to people kind of a little bit more how it works, I think some people out there, I know I certainly have in the past thought, Oh, you're going to log, you're going to go in, you're going to cut down a tree, that's it. What is it that goes into it? How, 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 uh, how much planning is there? How scientific is it? And how much are you, are you really trying to manage the forest rather than just simply coming in and saying, oh, we're going to take these trees out? When I go to the forest with a landowner, the first question I'll ask him, what do you want in this woods 20 years from now or 50 years from now? I need to get that landowner to think ahead. What do you want here? From there, we can start using science. Um, if they're talking wildlife, you know, and then we need to be specific on wildlife. Are we talking uh, uh, deer? Are we talking uh, shrewling warblers? Both need a different type of habitat. Mm -hmm. But a warble, because warbler, a shrewling warbler likes large oak trees because they put their nest. Eight, six to eight feet away from the trunk of the tree on limbs six to eight inches around. So somehow we need to figure maybe a hundred years ahead or a hundred and fifty years ahead, how are we going to develop that tree for habitat for that warbler? Uh, deer, they like to eat, they like to browse, so we need to have things on the forest floor where they can browse on. Mm -hmm. uh, deer don't like a park. They need to, a place to, to where they feel comfortable and stuff yeah. they can eat. Yeah. So. Or they could just go wherever it is that I'm hunting, because <laughs> I certainly won't find them. <laughs> or, or my garden at home. <laughs> All right, we've reached the time to take our first commercial break. Stay with us. We'll be right back on CW14 Focus.